So, welcome to Sports Vision Pros. This is Dr. Keith Smithson here. Uh, you guys know me. You've seen me many times. Uh, we're going to get into our VIP MVP NBA trainer team here, our advisory board members, uh, Ernest Eugene of the Orlando Magic, Eric Waters of the Utah Jazz, uh, two of uh, my good friends going back uh, many, many years, I guess, at this point that we've known each other and, uh, you know, hugely respected um, individuals in the athletic training world. Uh, I think the world of these two individuals and, you know, just thrilled to have them on tonight so we can learn a little bit uh, about vision uh, and vision in sport and specifically its relationship to, to athletic training, which is really, you know, a major component of, of building together a sports medicine team. You just can't do it without um, the point guard. And the point guard in this case is always, in my opinion, the athletic trainer. So uh, I'm thrilled to have these two gentlemen on tonight. Uh, thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So can we talk first about what an athletic trainer is for, for our other medical colleagues and some of the coaches and some of the players who jump on here that maybe are youth, uh, high school athletes, things like that, that, you know, are first time in a training room as a freshman. What is an athletic trainer? What are the roles and responsibilities of an athletic trainer and specifically in the NBA? But what's a day to day for you guys? Ernest, you want to take that first? Sure. So uh, by definition, athletic trainer is an allied health professional. Uh, became recognized as an allied health professional back in 1991. And we uh, specialize in healthcare of our athletes, of athletes. And that centers around prevention, centers around rehabilitation, conditioning of athletes. Uh, it, it also it centers around those things, but there's also components of nutrition that we have a knowledge base in, uh, sports science that we have a knowledge base in, et cetera. So that's what an athletic trainer is. What's a day-to-day -day athletic trainer responsibility look like in the NBA, Eric? You get up tomorrow morning. What's the day look like for you? Obviously, we're outside of season a little bit right now, but let's take an average day. Yeah, and um, just adding to Ernest's comments, we're, we're basically the first-line medical care for athletes. And so that's the first thing we do in the morning. We go in, have, have a meeting with our staff, our performance health staff, and – decide uh, what the day is going to look like and break it up in terms of uh, uh, evaluation of players that are coming in, how they're feeling, uh, healthy players and players who might have uh, sustained an injury, um, what treatment's going to look like, uh, what rehabilitation schedule is going to look like that day, what the strength and conditioning uh, schedule is going to be that day, and then, and then practice, and then post-practice recovery and treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And so – the athletic trainers uh, involved a bit in all of that, um, but mostly responsible for um, the, you know, the injury rehab, uh, injury evaluation, treatment, and um, helping um, helping our staff direct that. That's basically it. Yeah, we'll, we'll schedule some uh, appointments with docs if we need it, um, and then upkeep all the notes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, like I said, my, my opinion has always been, you know, really, depending on the sport you're talking about, the athletic trainer is the gatekeeper to, to medical care, really. I mean, they're, they're the, the point guard, the quarterback, whatever you want to say, that, you know, information and communication flows through the athletic trainer to, to get things done, whether it be, as, you know, Eric mentioned, rehabilitation services, whether it be a performance enhancement, whether it be um, communication and getting that player off to a doctor and, and the communication to not just in the professional world, the player, but you're talking about potentially the coach, the general manager, the agent, you know, there's a lot of sometimes communication that has to be coordinated. And, um, you know, when, when I look at these two gentlemen and sometimes see a cell phone, you know, sewed onto their ear, you know why? I mean, there's a lot of information going in and out of these individuals. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I've always kind of seen um, in my years of, of professional sports. Um, we get the question a lot about what is sports vision. And, and I think it's, very, it's framed very much the same way. There's a lot of components to sports vision. And I think the, the easy answer is that sports vision is, you know, meeting the visual needs of an athlete. So, I mean, that's the simple definition, but when you really pare that down, that means a lot more than fitting glasses and contact lenses. Um, you know, that's one component, obviously, is kind of the foundation for us, is making sure that, you know, athletes can see clearly. Uh, but then we also have things like a performance vision assessment. You know, what makes that different than um, seeing a stationary chart at the end of the wall? Um, and when you have a performance vision assessment, that's really looking at, you know, the dynamic needs of an athlete that maybe isn't playing a stationary or static sport, but they're playing a sport in motion and they're in motion. And that's a very de demanding environment compared to 
you know, sitting in maybe an exam lane and getting a, a comprehensive eye exam that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, injury prevention is a part of what we do in sports vision. You know, are there things that we can do to enhance visual qualities to help prevent injuries? Um, injury management is obviously another component. Uh, we're going to talk about that as we go as well. And, and one of the newest ones that really kind of came into our realm in the last couple of years has been concussion and concussion management, concussion rehab, and being a part of the integral part of that injury rehabilitation team is when there's a visual component that there's a sport vision specialist to kind of help with that as well. So um, I think if we, if we look at those, they're very similar to what we just heard about from athletic training. And, you know, it would be our goal as, as optometrists and as sports vision providers to kind of lead that visual component role in meeting that need that the athletic trainer picks up the phone and says, hey, we have something here that falls in the visual realm and I need somebody to help me manage that. And that's where their goal is to find someone like us that we can work together with. Um, so if we talk about you know, optometry, ophthalmology, that's a question we get a lot too. What's the difference? And it's really just physical and functional. I mean, every team that I work with has a team ophthalmologist and that team optometrist. It's the same thing as having an orthopedic surgeon and a physical therapist. You know, we have the, the doc who does the physical, uh, the surgical and the ACL repair, and then you have to go right into rehabilitation and start going through strengthening and conditioning and agility and flexibility work. So, you know, there's that component of physical and functional. And for us, that's ophthalmology optometry. So sport vision, I think, incorporates all of that um, in one piece. So if we take the first component of refractive needs, you know, this is something that I get asked a lot. Is there a visual requirement in the NVA? Are there, are there things that we know, are there studies out there that you gentlemen know about that says um, we need to have X amount of acuity? We need to be a 2020 guy or a 2030 guy. I've never seen such a thing. Is there, is there such a thing to your knowledge? No. Yeah, the tricky thing Not to is- my knowledge either. Yeah, and, and that's where I think, you know, really to my, my question there is, I think it's a shame that we don't know those things. And, and one, of our, one of our goals in Sports Vision Pros is to create the connections that an optometrist and an athletic trainer could decide at some point, I want to do a study on that and figure out what the average visual acuity is for basketball, let's say. We have a study in Major League Baseball that says the average for Major League Baseball is to be 2012. So 2012 is a line and a half better than 2020 acuity. So if we have a marker, we know going into spring training physicals, we have to hit that or we're below average. So my question, I guess, for you gentlemen is, how important do you think acuity is in basketball? I've seen players through the years that didn't have 2020 vision. They were amazing basketball players. Have you seen the same? Yeah, I think even when Ernest and I worked together, we had a player whose depth perception, uh, not just acuity, was <laughs> like one of the, like you saw him, he was one of the lowest we've ever had, right? Yeah. And he was good. He was a good player. But yeah, I think, um, I think it, the way most people look at it, even in terms of management and, and, and evaluating players, what's their acuity period, bottom line, reading the chart. Yeah. Is that okay? If that's okay, then we may not understand exactly what that means beyond that. You know, so I, I think it's really important. Um, I'll let Ernest pick up on that. Um, but I think, you know, it's particularly um, – spacing the court and then obviously shooting the basketball is probably the most important skill I think yeah. um, unless you guys can think of something else that's a, it's a pretty important skill outside of what we could talk about with injury prevention which is a topic we'll probably broach on sure. tonight what do you think Ernest? I piggyback on what Eric said I think it's extremely important and what we find a lot of and I've had the uh, opportunity to work at the collegiate level as well and we find this in the pro level where the player is so accustomed to playing at 20, 30 acuity and they just, that's normal to them. But if we could actually assess it and if we can actually improve it and actually correct it, I found players that, oh, wow, this is a big difference. Sure. Such a big difference to me due to the fact that I've always played since maybe AAU basketball and coming through high school, collegiate basketball, They've always seen the court in that way, but they didn't realize they could see it in HD, if you would. Yeah, that, and that's a fascinating point. I mean, I think there is something to the fact that you don't know what you're missing until you find out what you're missing, right? And, you know, our, our assumption is that everyone should see at their clearest level. So if their vision isn't maximized, 
you know, during a preseason evaluation with our teams here in DC, you know, that's what I'm going to introduce is the, the opportunity to potentially try sports glasses or talk through contact lenses and their, their opportunity or their interest in wearing that. You know, refractive surgery obviously is an option that a lot of our athletes have gone through, but you know, our assumption is that seeing clearer is better. You, you, we don't have a study to, to prove that, but you know, Eric touched on a great point there too. And that's, you know, again, acuity I think is important. Um, I would try to maximize it, but if it falls at the, um, at the other side of saying, well, I'm trying these contact lenses. It's frustrating me. I can't put them in. They're irritating me. My eyes are tearing. I just don't want to do it. I've been, to Ernest's point, I've been playing with 20-30 vision since I was in college. You drafted me, so you must think, you know, I can play the game, and I'm just going to go with 20-30 vision. And again, I've seen that be very successful. I think Eric made a great point. When you have differences in acuity, then that could be a big issue. You can have 20-30 acuity in both eyes and see slight blur out there. Maybe you don't see the scoreboard perfectly clear. But again, we're not seeing seams and rotation in the NBA. We don't have to worry about a curveball. Uh, we also have a target that's not moving anywhere. The basket is where the basket is. And I think there's certainly something to the fact where you shoot that 15-foot jumper a million times, and you could probably do it with your eyes closed to a certain extent. But when you have one eye that's 20-30 and the other one at 20-80, now you have a difference in acuity and that can create an issue with depth perception, which is now judging the rim or the distance to that rim. And maybe you shoot great uh, inside the key, but once you step back behind the arc, your shot goes down significantly and everyone just thought it was your stroke, but you had that good release and maybe it's that visual component. So I think that's a fascinating point to talk about depth perception. So if we go into a performance vision assessment, a performance vision assessment for me is looking at other components aside from just acuity. And you know, we've always kind of built a performance assessment a little bit specific to the sport, sometimes even specific to the player, or sometimes our goaltenders will be tested a little differently than our on ice players in hockey, let's say. Um, our NBA players, we tend to test in up gaze, you know, kind of looking up as most of their world is, versus some of our soccer and hockey players where we're testing kind of in down gaze, which is where most of their targets are coming from. But a performance assessment is really going into those other components, things like eye tracking, eye movements, um, you know, we have a muscular component to testing in the performance assessment. Uh, depth perception is a big one there. Uh, we also talk about things like neurological quantification, the ability to now gauge and quantify how quickly an athlete can process information. So their decision making on the court, which I think is a, a really fascinating thing to talk about. But is there a mandate in the NBA um, or really even back to the college days, uh, Ernest, you mentioned there as well, um, what does a vision test look like for, for a standard? I mean, we, we have a relationship. We've known each other for a long time, us, but um, what's a standard assessment look like? Does it go really into performance assessments mostly, or is it more that standard chart in the training room? I would say it's that standard chart in the athletic training room. Uh, some, some sports, maybe like, let's take men's basketball, for example. You have the ability to say, hey, I'm going to take our 17 guys or our 15 guys, and we're actually going to go to an eye doctor and we're going to assess visual acuity further. But for an athletic trainer that has soccer and softball or whatever other sports, they don't have the ability and sometimes don't have the funding to go, hey, we're gonna just we're gonna do this for all of these athletes, for all of our athletes. So if you did it for the non-revenue sports, you almost have to do it for all 800 student athletes sure. at the collegiate level. In the NBA, and Eric's going to know better than I am on this one, but in the NBA, I know they those that come to the combine do go through in a vision test, and there, there's a visual acuity test. I don't know the components of it, but what we also try to do in Orlando is we try to take our players and refer their own on for vision testing. Not all are always wanting to do that. Some will because they they feel it's important. Some won't because they, they feel like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need that. But uh, we're trying to push that they do that more and more so we can get to the point where all 17 of our players are doing that during their physical. Wait, process. are you telling me that not every player does exactly what you tell them to do, Ernest? <laughs> <laughs> Lead the fifth. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's – it, I think yeah, that's – Jimmy. <laughs> constantly stumble through is that, you know – uh, the, the athlete who's maybe the veteran player who, you know, comes in and says, look, you know, I, I have 20-20 vision. I've never worn glasses or contact lenses. I, need, I don't need to go further, further with this testing. I see clearly. 
but I think you know the point is that there is more there, and and we hope that again this is a, a beginning uh, segment on sort of what those visual components are. But you know, use the resources on Sports Vision Pros. Take a look at those different visual skills, and 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 look, the trainers are very valuable. These athletic trainers are, like I said, the gatekeeper to medical care, and and I would say you know, be engaged and, and, and ask and see if you push the level a little bit, maybe we can get a little vision testing here or find a doc that we could affiliate with to do some testing. I know for myself, it was, you know, is the highlight of my week and my year is when I get to work together with these individuals and go down to work with other teams and put together, you know, a real performance assessment that's, that's really sort of specific to the sport. It's really exciting. It's engaging. It's something that I can think through and based on year to year, the technology's change and there's new abilities to test. So, you know, it's a fascinating thing to do. And, and ultimately, if you don't have the knowledge, that's what we're there for, is to try to make that connection and build that education. So we can either get someone there to do it or train you to do it yourself. Um, but I think there's a lot that can be done in the visuals realm. And, and the performance vision assessment, I think, is the point that then we can break off from and build uh, visual enhancement, um, which is the next topic. So if we're talking about testing all of these critical skills, eye tracking, eye movements, if we're looking at you know, how strong are the muscles, how good is the depth perception component, uh, visual thinking, decision making, if we find things that are off, you know, it'd be sort of silly for me to test things I can't fix, you know, or that we don't have a training or intervention for. So um, we've known each other a long time, probably going back almost 20 years for myself and, and these two fine individuals. But tell me about things that you've seen even going back to your college days on, on the visual training skill, the enhancement, basic things that you see coaches do, different drills that they might do that have a vision component, some of the more higher tech kind of things. What have you seen from vision training, the enhancement side of it? I've seen more and more now. Uh, we, we have an individual who's a PhD from, uh, from Argentina uh, that's, that's visiting us with the Jazz who is doing a lot of testing and uh, performance analysis and, and training centered around dual tasks uh, or multiple tasks, um, which obviously includes, you know, visual uh, function, not just visual health, like we can tend to come from that angle, but, you know, and, and that's all based around performance. Um, you know, for instance, throwing a balloon in the air, popping a balloon in the air, catching the ball, throwing the ball back, popping the balloon in the air, knowing where it is, or watching the balloon and catching the ball. Any combination of difficult uh, visual, spatial, visual motor task and tasking to enhance performance in terms of visual spatial awareness, um, and and not to mention the other things we're doing now with uh, with injury prevention. Um, there's a reason that when you're doing a balance testing or you're on any kind of balance enhancement device, which I believe are is ex is extremely important for us in many different ways um, in rehabbing and preventing prevention of injuries. Um, but when you close your eyes, what happens? You lose, you lose all that kinesthetic and proprioceptive awareness. So when you're on the court, I mean, there's some, there's some data and some evidence now that uh, Keith and I have talked about this. Some, you know, if you're looking to your left or right and you're making a play um, and some of these guys that you've seen with a jump stop, ACL tear. Um, they're not always looking straight ahead. They're looking to their left or looking to their right. And we add that into our prevention programs um, because vision is such an important part of taking in the world and being able to, the, the kinesthetic output has to be um, on point. If it's not, you can put yourself in uh, you know, grave danger of a of a significant injury. So those are the kind of things that we're seeing. I, I think that it's, it, it's a whole new world. I mean, it's a, it's like the reason you're whole, doing this whole program, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a brave frontier, you know, it's, I mean, it's a new mixed metaphors, brave new world in the, in the frontier kind of uh, uh, science now. And it's, it's uh, it's going to become more important, and it's going to continue to become more important, um, and it's never going back to where it was. And we haven't even talked about concussion yet. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it's it's funny because there there was obviously uh, a time in vision training, vision performance that you know we used beads and strings and very kind of basic level things that you really couldn't quantify. 
And so, you know, I think the vision, training, vision, performance um, aspect of, of vision was sort of um, kind of put aside by the, the traditional scientific community. It wasn't able to be quantified. You didn't have objective data. So, you know, the newer generation technologies that, you know, Eric's talking about, I mean, we have companies like Synaptic and NeuroTrack and Right Eye, and they, they just come out every, every week, NeuroTrainer, here's another one, Penovi. Penova. Quantifiable, yeah. objectively quantifiable technologies that give us a way to quantify visual assessments, go through performance enhancement, and then quantify improvement. So, you know, again, statistics and data, we're seeing, you know, I think sports science is obviously an emerging, you know, conversation and something we can probably do on another day. And we're seeing that a, a little bit more, if, if I'm not mistaken, from overseas. I see a lot of the, the, play, the, the personnel that are coming to our teams from, from the UK, from, from Spain, from, you know, South America, as Eric mentioned, that you know, sports science is kind of this, this connection of data points and how to kind of utilize data and, and, and find performance enhancement. Um, and vision is now one of those really important buckets that we put together where we can supply information and data. Um, and look, we're dealing with, we're talking about the NBA with these two individuals, the most elite top in the world at what they do. There's not a better basketball league in the world. These are the best of the best of the best. You're talking about a Ferrari racing a Porsche. And when you have a Ferrari racing a Porsche, does it potentially take little differences to make that difference, to, to really put yourself on the court where the other guy's sitting on the bench? and take that team deep into the playoffs where the other team doesn't go. Could it be a component? How, how much is that room for error at this level, Ernest? I mean, it's gotta be, these guys are so close from a talent standpoint, it's gotta be almost infinitesimal sometimes. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very minute in regards to uh, having, that, having that extra edge. And I think uh, for, from our standpoint, like our organization looks at it from that standpoint of, if we're going to look for that extra edge, we're going to try to find that in the health and performance side in regards to preparation of our players, uh, availability of our players, et cetera, et cetera. And so the vision is a component of that. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, the, the basic skills are things that, that still have, um, that are still founded in science. There's scientific principles to a lot of those basic tests. And I think, look, we try not to put those aside because if you're dealing with a, a 12 year old, you know, basketball team that you're the coach of and you're saying well I can't invest in you know, thousands of dollars of technology but can I take visual concepts and train them during my team's practice sure absolutely I mean obviously at this level we're not talking about you know economics and finances being necessarily a limiting factor to the technologies that we can build in but you know they're building those same visual skills and I think that's important to say that you know this can be done at youth levels and all the way up through and I think there's an importance to introducing youth athletes to something that's being done by the pros because the point is, if you've seen it when you're 12, it doesn't look unusual in high school, and it certainly doesn't look unusual in college. And when you step into the NBA your rookie year, God willing, you've seen this before. You're comfortable with this, and this is a part of your training protocol. Just like going to the weight room and going through your routine, you know that this is something that made a difference for you. So, you know, I think that piece of it, Eric, when you talk about injury management, um, I'm curious about that because I've always felt personally that injury management or injury prevention was a better way to express um, the potential benefits for visual performance to an elite professional athlete um, versus the performance enhancement side of it. Um, and I say that because at a certain point, they're there. They signed their contract. They are the best of the best of the best. Who am I to come in and say that I can make you better? But if I tell them I can potentially keep them safe and keep them on the court or talk to their trainer or their coach or their agent and say, look, we're seeing something here that's, that's potentially risk for injury, as you mentioned with these ACL injuries. Um, is that a better way to communicate with an elite athlete or, or would you say that they're open to both conversations? Well, I think both conversations lead to um, the possibility for a bigger, longer contract. And that, that speaks to them, whether it's yeah. performance uh, on the floor with the, with the basketball or, well, that's what we're after all, whether it's a uh, skill acquisition and skill enhancement with the basketball or performance enhancement on the sports science, strength and conditioning side of things. Um, if either one of those can help their game um, and, and help them play basketball better at a higher capacity, uh, which then translates to, you know, more money and success. I think, I think both speak loudly to them. Yeah, sure. 
but I think we're missing some on the other side. You know, I, I think, I think we're not, I, I don't think the players quite under, they understand practice. They understand having a ball in their hand and, you know, skill development we all agree that that's important but I, I think that there's a component of what you're getting at with uh you, you know just performance health uh, performance health whether it's uh injury prevention or it's uh just getting stronger or more aware or visual spatial awareness is improved and enhanced which helps them on the floor if you're a point guard seeing the floor ho however you want to look at it sure yeah, I mean, that's that side needs more developing. It's one thing I was always, you know, fascinated by is, is is the speed and strength of your game. The NBA game, when you sit courtside or get that close to the game, the the size and physicality and simply just the simple speed of that game. The court looks so small when you get down there with these individuals just flying around at the speed that they are, and the game just happens so immediate and so quickly. And I think you touched on something that's really valuable there, Eric. It's it's something that I've always. Um, tried to have my conversations with, with our head trainers is, um, is building in a visual training component if we're going to do that and finding a way to integrate that into training that they're doing already in a day-to-day -day routine. So if they're doing some core stability drill or some agility drill or uh, they're, you know, the point guard's working over here with his you know, specific coach or you have your, your frontline players working with the big guy coach over here, and, you know, these are drills that they're doing already, but we're able to add a visual component make it mm -hmm. more difficult by adding multiple balls or making them, you know, think through multiple different routines. So, you know, adding things to what they're doing already doesn't add time, which again, we're always limited in time in these practice sessions. So, um, and still adds a level of complexity that I think, you know, looks at that performance enhancement issue, but the injury management side too. So Ernest, have you seen things like that where your coaches are open to more integration of things? If you put it into something they're doing already versus, well, Hey, we need to carve out 15 more minutes for a, a vision training program or a, you know, whatever, a, a balance drill over here. Is it better? I work with uh, different coaches, obviously, and there are coaches that are very specific on everything that they do. And for instance, I'll, I'll give you one, the ball handling drill. This ball handling drill that a lot of coaches do. And while they're doing the ball handling drill, yeah, you got to keep the dribble and you're throwing a tennis ball at them. The tennis yeah. ball may go up, it may go down. Wherever it goes, you got to be able to catch that. So you've got to see the tennis ball. Watch yourself catching a tennis ball while not losing your dribble on, with the one hand. So when somebody does that, dribbling with their right, catching with their left, probably a little better for them. But when you have them catch with their right while dribbling with their left, now, as Eric alluded to earlier, it throws them off and uh, it, it, uh, it puts them in a state of uh, they feel unbalanced because they're not used to doing that. Uh, there are coaches that are doing different drills and says, your foot didn't touch the line. Well, you've got to be able to see from your peripheral vision while you're coming off, we call it a banana cut, while you're coming off and you're, and you're blocking off the, uh, the offensive player so you can take a charge. You've got to have your feet in place, but you can't be out of bounds. You've got to be in bounds, but you can't give them too much room because they can go straight past you if, you if your feet are not on the sideline or the baseline. So paying attention and having an awareness of that and being able to see through your peripheral vision, this is where it needs to be. It can't be two inches less, or it can't be three inches less, because that gives the offensive player a place to get past you, essentially. So yeah. peripheral vision is important, too. I love that. And, and those are both drills that can be done with, with no added equipment, no added cost that, it, that any coach could do tomorrow. You know, then we, we talk through higher level technologies, things like strobe training glasses that I know both of you have seen before. Which, which add an entirely different level of difficulty when you do one of those two drills and then you add your know, strobe training glasses to start limiting visual information. And now that athlete has to do that same drill with significantly less information, which makes it even that much more challenging. So, but they can be added to any drill you're already doing, which I think is always a great thing when you can do that. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the injury management side it, for me is always important. And again, you know, the holistic approach to sport vision is making sure that we're building better, safer, stronger athletes, but um, you know, we're, we're doctors first and we're clinicians first and we're allied health professionals first. And, and our goal is to keep those athletes safe and allow them to perform at their peak. So um, injury management is a big issue for me too. Um, there was a study done at the University of Cincinnati's football team about concussion prevention and vision training uh, where they did three years of studies on their concussion incidence rate. Uh, before vision training, they started vision training for three years uh, and saw a significant reduction in concussion rates. And, you know, so we take that as a study that says, 
well, why? And, and I think Ernest touched on things like that, you know, peripheral vision, uh, Eric's point of spatial awareness. Um, you know, if you're driving down the court, flying down the court, you know, doing the thing that these incredible athletes do, you know, being able to react to split, split second quicker, having just a bit better depth perception may have helped you avoid that contact or make it more of a glancing blow as opposed to a direct blow. You know, those kind of things we hope are injury prevention mechanisms. Eric talked about eye tracking and, and, and you know, knee injuries, you know, those kind of things. If there's a visual component, we'd like to be able to address that too. So I think injury management is a big one for us. Um, I think we can all agree. Um, injury treatment is another avenue though. And obviously one of the things, probably the biggest bucket you guys have is, is managing injuries, I would guess, uh, day to day. Um, and so I think that's another great opportunity for us to talk about what Sport Vision does and how we work together. Um, you know, I've had a chance to work with both of these amazing individuals and, and both times we were together, we put together injury management packs. We had an eye emergency pack. Um, we had something that, you know, um, they were familiar with the drops that were in there, the different things that were in there. And, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about the communication and things that happen when there's an injury, let's say on the road, um, when we're maybe the doctor maybe isn't on site. Um, what are the clinicians that are mandated to be on this, on the side at an NBA game? Who, who's mandated to be right there at the court? Outside of the head athletic trainer, do you have other mandates of who has to be there? Uh, I, I know you have to have a orthopedic surgeon, not necessarily on the court side, but within close proximity. Uh, I don't know if you have to have a primary care present, but most teams have a primary care present. Uh, in, in terms of vision or dental, so an optometrist or a dentist, I don't believe that's required, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but I know most teams do have that available as well. And you're basically, I think, required to have a, an internist and, and a sports medicine uh, orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, and that's, that's been my experience as well, and, and I think it becomes a great scenario for us to build a relationship based on trust that says, you know, look, um, if there's an injury that happens related to the eye and I'm not necessarily mandated to be there, I'm on call. And I'm on call for my teams 24 seven. I am always accessible. And in today's world, what we're talking about a lot is telemedicine and being able to see patients remotely without having them come into the office with our you know, unique scenario that's going on in the world today. But telemedicine is something that I'm comfortable with because I've done it for 20 years with my professional teams. And how important is it for you to have a, a, the, the doctors and the staff that are accessible and communicate and you can go through something like that. There's an eye injury. Maybe the orthopedic surgeon takes the player up and says, look, it doesn't look good. Let's contact the doc and, and do some things remotely because we're on the road. We might not be home till tomorrow. Um, how critical is that component? Yeah, that, just, just speaking to what the requirements were, I, I, I'm not sure they're, they're – I'm sure there will be the, the uh, NBA Phys Physicians Society have their policies and procedures about who they want um, at the games. But I can tell you and Ernest can tell you that every, everywhere we go, every team we visit will have – both of those people, um, they will have most times um, an eye physician, whether it's an op op ophthalmologist or an optometrist, they will have dental services. Um, and they may even have, you know, chiropractor or some other uh, specially trained uh, physician uh, on call throughout the game that are at the game. And I think that's the, the, the rule rather than the exception, wouldn't you agree? Ernest. I never yeah, I would agree. Agree. So yeah, yeah. So it's, a, I think it's really important to have a, a specialized person. Now these guys are, these guys are very, um, you know, not, not to objectify these great guys that we work with, um, but they are worth a lot to the organization and um, they're very important to the organization and they invest a lot of money into these individuals and it's important that they're well taken care of and their, their vision is as important as anything that they have, obviously. So we, we want to make sure that that's, that's a, a something, sure. something that we have on hand, you know, someone like you. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a trust level as well. I mean, the way it's set up, I, I know for us in the NBA is that, you know, we're on site to make sure that we're there to take care any player from any team that has an injury because look, you're a doctor, you're there to take care of players, regardless of what color Jersey they wear, you're there to manage players. And I can tell you, you know, again, through the years I've been 
busier with other teams sometimes with our team, but that's sure. why you're there. And, and, and it's nice to have that peace of mind that you know, when Eric's on the road or Ernest is on the road, um, something happens, you can pick up the phone and call your doc at home too and say, hey, look, we're going to be back on the flight tonight back home. Just want to let you know what's going on. Is there something you want me to start with treatment now so that we can get ahead of this thing before they get home? Um, our, the doc there said this, but you know, I know you have a relationship with them. I know you know, he wears contact lenses. He's always, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so I think that that trust level and that communication, again, starts with the trainer and you have to have people that you trust that are inside that, you know, that circle of trust, right? Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. yeah, like we, we had a head coach, a visiting head coach that I happen to know whose wife was with them on the trip, pulls out the piece of paper out of her purse, slices her cornea. I have to call you, Dr. Smithson. And I remember that we, uh, we did a little dye test and we could see the laceration we put on it. She was in excruciating pain, of course, yes. and put a, a bandage, uh, uh, contact on and she was fine and yeah did great. absolutely <laughs> and thank goodness you you know those are the things that happen you know like you're saying they do they do very quickly and and it's it, to my my uh my experience most docs whether they be emergency docs or you know orthopedics kind of don't like the eye it's kind of squishy and, and gross and <laughs> people like to kind of avoid that so yeah. we're we're willing to jump in and do what we can do on that side of things um Let's talk about concussion. Concussion is a big uh, word for all of us in, in, in our teams and our sports and our athletes that we work with. Um, and there's a visual component a lot of times in concussion, you know, not all the time, but when there's a visual component, you know, Eric and I, we talked about this, you know, probably going back 10 years ago, almost when things were really emerging in the science and what was happening out there. And um, the question was, when, when do we begin rehab? I think we can all agree at this point that, that there are different rehab techniques and things that, that are very effective for people that are suffering with concussion symptoms past that, you know, 24 hour, 48 hour waiting time, whatever. But it used to be sit in a dark room, let these athletes recover. Don't, you know, get near lights and TVs and things like that. But we're initiating training a lot sooner. Um, what, where, where do you feel comfortable at this point saying that there's now uh, rehab or things that can initiate after a concussion? How, how long do we let these athletes go without doing something? I just think once we uh, control symptoms, and uh, some, uh, not necessarily saying, hey, it needs to be uh, your, your GSC, your greatest symptom checklist needs to be a, all zeros. But I think once you've controlled symptoms, you, you're in a position where you can now begin to exercise the brain a little bit, if you would. Uh, and eye tracking, eye movement plays a role in that as well. So with any injury, especially like if it's a joint specific related injury, we want to do that as soon as possible, get them moving, get things going, et cetera. And I would, and I think we've started to emerge in regards to that with concussions as well. Yeah. And Eric, we've talked about a lot of different visual related concussion symptoms, obviously personally here just recently, but uh, what are some of the other things Eric talked or Ernest talked about some of the eye tracking things. We've had things like light sensitivity, things like that with players as well. Sure. Um, things like that as well. That you've heard. Oh, yeah. I mean, photophobia. I mean, all, all the things that you might experience if you've seen any concussions. I mean, you know, it, it can be just one eye or both eyes. You could have actual pain, you know, Yeah. from it, it causes acute pain if, if they've got any kind of photosensitivity. Uh, sensitivity. Um, yeah, I mean, and headaches caused by um, just just the way the eye is reacting to the concussion. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, for me, it was sort of an exciting thing because concussion in a way became the first true multidisciplinary problem that we had to deal with as sports medicine practitioners, right? You, anyone who feels like they can fix it on their own, you know, someone you should go call someone else. I mean, I think we're all at the table trying to figure out sometimes what is this athlete's concussion symptoms and what are the ways we're going to get them back quickly, safely, and effectively. And I think that's really an exciting, you know, environment where there's a lot of collaboration between, you know, the different medical professionals and having to have good communication, again, geared through the athletic trainer who is, you know, coordinating all of that communication and making sure that things are done in a synchronized manner to make sure that these athletes are going through it, you know, in a, in a reasonable manner. But that, that's something that, that truly involves a lot of integration of care, doesn't it, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We don't understand it. We still don't understand concussion all that well. Uh, at least uh, us, some of the end users, maybe the researchers are understanding it a little better these days, but 
what to do about them uh, is is still evolving every seems like biannually <laughs> yeah you know so yeah I mean, it's extremely important that we're all that we're all involved because um it, you could even say from a dental standpoint what kind of mouthpiece are we going to use to prevent concussion and when a concussion happens we're going to see a neurologist to see how the brain's working and we need to see um the athletic trainer because the one's going to implement what what dr smith's in like what you're going to tell us in terms of visual rehab um, and then the uh, in, internal medicine doctor is the one who has to take all of this in and decide whether um, that guy can go back to play or not. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, obviously the coach and general manager, agent, it's like any other injury, but concussion particularly so, yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that was tricky for me, I mean, and this is probably going back almost 10, 12 years when concussion really started to become – you know, a big word for all of us to deal with in sport was um, the lack of objectively quantifiable points that we could use in our return to play scenario. So having things like that that we can use today um, are obviously helpful to, to both of you that, that are in the front line of when can this athlete take those next steps in, in that return to play scenario. So um, pretty important to have those kind of points as well when you have objective points as well. Oh Yeah, it, it, it's definitely important. Uh, as you stated, we're getting, a, I shouldn't say getting away, but we're getting more objective measures. Before we'd only have subjective measures, they're, they're scoring a six. Well, what's a six to them versus the next person? So the objective measures that we're seeing now is obviously uh, protein being released in the blood. So we, we're getting biomarkers. So that's giving us objective information in regards to at what level when we get that, does it, does it signify this person's been diagnosed with a concussion? And here's the objective measure to show it. I think... Uh, and this is your forte, Dr. Sirson, but I think there's objective measures that we could find as well from a sports vision, from a vision standpoint, that's going to tell us this person's been concussed due to the fact X, Y, and Z is showing. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, that's... Well, I, that's let me just, let me just say uh, it, the baseline measures that we're, we're taking in every sport, that, that's everything. If we don't do the baseline, then all the things that are Ernest are men, is mentioning um, doesn't work because we have nothing to compare it to. So, and we're learning more of the things we need to baseline test. Yeah, I, I would say that, and that was what I was going to get at too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we're sharing the same brain today here. It must be that Dunder Mifflin hat there. Um, <laughs> but it's something about um, the fact that if we can do baseline testing and if we can have objective data, I think sometimes that can be a great entrance into sport vision for a team that maybe hasn't used it before, or a doc and a trainer who haven't had the relationship built that that the three of us have over 20 years, but I'm um, saying, look, I can do some baseline, uh, you know, concussion metrics that we could use later if need be. And it's a great way to, to quantify things. There's a couple of different companies, I think, right? Uh, there's a bunch of them that quantify eye tracking and eye movements. There's pupil measurements. There's, there's a lot of things that we can use that can be objective pieces of information. It's not everything, but if you can add it to the bucket and say, look, we're looking good on our SCAT testing. We're looking good on you know, the different metrics that we're going through and every league mandates things a little differently. Right. So the NFL, the MLB, NBA is all a little different. But anytime we can add objective data into that bucket, it just helps all of us feel more confident with the decisions that we're making with these athletes and, and their careers. Right. So um, for me, I think that's sometimes a, a great way to get in because I get that question a lot is, well, you know, I'd love to go approach a team. I'd love to, to work with a team like you do. It sounds fantastic. But but how do I go knock on that door? And what does the trainer want to hear from me um, to give me the time of day to answer my question? So. You guys are the experts there. You're getting the knock on the door from the, from the young green Dr. Smithson who says, hey, I'd love to work with your team. Um, what do you want to hear from that individual? And, and, and what's going to be the best way to start that relationship? I think, I think we want to hear uh, that this person is on the cutting edge. We want to know that this person's not just there to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to take, let's use vision, for example. I'm going to take your players through a visual acuity test and, uh, test for glaucoma, et cetera, and then we'll be done. And if you need me, I'm here in the background. And if you don't need me, well, I won't bother you. I, I think your approach to how you've done it with during our time in Washington and beyond that as well has been perfect because you're giving us more information. You're giving us things that we can take to our organizations and say, this is how we stay ahead of the curve. And that's what, our, that's what we want to see because that's going to be attractive to our organizations and our our leadership, our management, et cetera, 
So being able to be on the cutting edge, being able to be ahead of the research or on top of the research of what's occurring in your in that respective field is what we want to see. Yeah. Eric, what do you need to let me in the door? Other than, uh, you know, a nice cold beverage or something. Well, I'd do it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, with the advent of technology, sports science, all things I'm a big believer in and um, I feel are very important. With all of those things that we've, that we've got that are infiltrating, the, you know, our training facilities, time is really difficult to come by for the athletes, for us to fit everything in. I want to know, uh, I want someone to come prepared with the things that, like, that you're discussing with us of how he can help, um, what the cutting edges are, things I may not have thought about that can help the team and be able to um, tell me that in, you know, a couple of minutes of a meeting, you know, I, I don't request an hour, or half an hour, even um, that's, it's hard to give up that time. Um, but if you could do that, and I think it can be done in just a few minutes, you, you know, a discussion, here's what I can help you with, with your concussion stuff. If you don't have anybody, these are important things. Um, here's what I can help you with some of your training. Here's what can help you with some of your rehab. Here's some things you might not be thinking about things that I probably don't know, thing, things that are novel to us, things that you're good at and how you can help us as a resource. That's, those are the things you want to know. And, and I think they can be conveyed quite quickly. And because I, I don't think it takes too much cajoling to um, have someone uh, accept what you're offering. So, you know, if we go back to those components we talked about really that, that makes up an athletic trainer's day-to-day -day responsibilities and, and really what kind of makes up the definitions of, of a sports vision doc is, is really, I, I think, the way to go after it and to say, look, you know, these are the kind of things that I can bring to your team. I am willing to provide for your team. I am there for all levels of, of things related to sport vision. I can fit your glasses and contact lenses. I will help you with injury management. Well, I'll help you with concussion rehab will help you with putting together any kind of visual performance testing, training protocols and things that we can put together, uh, injury prevention mechanisms. You know, those are the kind of things that I think you go and say, these are all the things I can do and what are you comfortable with? And we will go along at the pace that you're comfortable. Uh, and I think the other is the trust factor. I mean, I, I go back to the story of, you know, how I started with the Wizards. This was actually before Eric was, was with the team. So uh, going back, boy, probably 15, 16, 17 years now, my first year with the Washington Wizards was actually Michael Jordan's first year here. And, you know, there's a trainer here before you, Eric, uh, named Steve Stricker. And Steve uh, was there, and, and him and I had a phone conversation, and we talked through a little bit of sports vision and what it was and what I thought I could bring to the team. Um, and we had a nice conversation. We got off the phone. He called me back a week or so later and said, hey, I have a player that, that needs some contact lenses. Can I send them out to you? Um, and when we sat down, you know, maybe weeks or, or months later after that and had another sit down, he said, you know why I called you? And I said, well, no, I, I assume it's because we talked through all the different things that, that I could do for the team and such. He said, well, yeah, that, that was great. But you called, we talked, we had a conversation for 10 minutes on the phone and not once did you mention Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. He said, you told me what you were going to bring to the team and what you were going to do to help us be better and help us be safer. And you didn't talk about MJ. And I said, MJ is part of the team, but I'm there to do anything I can to make these players safer and more effective. And that built a trust that we never broke that I wasn't there for the wrong reasons. I wasn't there to, you know, to kind of gain notoriety and do whatever it was. I just felt like I could do something to make the team better. I was a team player. I played collegiate sports. You know, for me, it's all about teamwork. And that's all I ever want to do is do my part to make the team the best that it can be. Um, we've had some fair, fantastic seasons here in DC the last couple of years and won a lot of shiny things, which don't happen very often, but it's been fun. And, and those are the, the rewards that you look for. It's not the individual gratitude. So I think that's a big thing too, is just going after it the right way and, and really coming at it with genuine intentions. Don't you think? Agreed. Yeah. And your availability was key. Your, you, like you said earlier, the, bill, the, the, the willingness to take a call at 10, 11 at night, if we need you after a game, whether we're on the West coast and it's midnight out here, you know, it, uh, or out there. Um, yeah. I mean, that those, that's a big deal that no, we can count on you when we call. Yeah. We know you're busy. We know you're busy all day, just like we are, but it's nice when we call that you, you, you're, you, you get back to us when you can, as soon as you can. And then 
You mentioned it before. Say, Ernest, winning yeah. championships and being successful in, in, in pro sports is a very difficult thing to do. And, and I think it starts with a good foundation and building a solid team, whether you're at a collegiate level, a high school level, or an elite travel youth sports league. It starts with building the right team. And, and from a, a sports medicine model, we, we think the same way. Building a team is critical to that team's success um, in safety and effectiveness. Um, so what are some parting words you have for, for your athletic trainer colleagues that, that maybe aren't familiar with sports vision um, that, you know, we've learned a little bit tonight about, you know, maybe a call to action for them, learn more and, and or do something or what would be just a piece of advice that you have for, for, for young trainers looking up to you two gentlemen and saying, you know, yeah, piece of advice. Uh, what, what I'll say is uh, I'm going to sound like Eric because th these are Eric's words. This is how he, he would say, you've got to know about it because it's important and it's, if concussions is an important aspect of what we're looking at, what we're treating, what we're trying to be ahead of, vision, sports vision is essential in that. It's essential in uh, making our athletes better. It, it's a data point, if you would. It, it's essential, you have to know about it. If you don't know about it, if you just brush it off, if you only think about vision when an injury happens or you only think about vision when it's time to look at the snail and chart and that's it, well, you're going to get left behind. I agree. That's, that's it right there. And, and, uh, and I've worked with some great eye physicians, ophthalmologists and optometrists who just didn't understand the athlete eye, you know, what, what some of the things to look for, some of the active functions of visual motor, visual spatial stuff, uh, the, rehab, some of the, you know, things that we utilize you for Dr. Smithson, they may not have much of an expertise. I would, I would, uh, I would encourage my colleagues to look for someone. Number one, like Ernest said, that person's essential for a sports medicine staff. You can't not have sports vision on a part of your staff. That's, that's the baseline right there. The next is to find someone who really wants to do like you're saying, to, to help the team no matter what, and then someone with the, uh, the knowledge in sports vision to do that. That's awesome. Well, and, and again, that's, that's why we built Sports Vision Pros. We built Sports Vision Pros to be a connection point between uh, multiple diff different health professionals that work uh, on this sports medicine team uh, and work together and collaborate together. Um, and we hope to share that education and, and make sure that we're making connections to make that happen. If you don't have a sports vision doc local to you, um, we have the training, we have the academy. You can become a member of Sports Vision Pros uh, tomorrow. Uh, you can take our academy courses. You can have your trainer take our academy courses. It's all to build education and awareness um, so that we can learn from each other uh, and be truly successful as a team. So uh, I want to thank uh, Ernest Eugene from the Orlando Magic, uh, Eric Waters from Utah Jazz. I truly hope you guys get back on the court and uh, keep running towards the playoffs here. You guys have both had a uh, better seasons than we have here. So I wish you all the best. And I thank you so very much for being here. Thanks, Doc. Truly important members of our advisory board on Sports Vision Pro. So uh, people that can teach us a lot and, and we can learn a lot from. So thanks to you both being here. Really, truly appreciate it.